Uh, good afternoon, folks. So I'm going to speak to you about a, a particular training methodology, proficiency based progression, which I think ha is very impactful. It is objectively the most impactful training methodology or skills training methodology that I've used in my uh, 15 odd year career in uh, teaching and learning and in instructional design to date. And I'm going to speak about how we've implemented it across various disciplines and outline the steps and then outline, I suppose, the plans for where it's going to go from here. Um, I don't expect to cover everything in the 10 minutes. And if anyone has questions afterwards, they can find me on LinkedIn or they can send me an email. That's perfectly fine. So this is a methodology that's called proficiency based progression, and it was predominant. It was designed initially for skills training around surgical skills. So very much in the medical and surgical space, and it was developed by Professor Anthony Gallagher. So it posits a series of stages that you would go through to develop, to train um, a surgeon or to train a trainee in general to proficiency and proficiency would be considered at a higher level than competency or something like that. So proficiency would be higher up on the on the skills ladder, so to speak. And I'll walk through what proficiency is defined as here. So through the five stages of this, we'll start with stage one. And stage one is where we you develop proficiency metrics and you validate those metrics. What that has meant to date is you take a recording of the procedure as it's currently being done at the moment or the task as it's been currently done. So for surgery, you record the surgeon performing the surgery. Um, if it's a communication skill, you record the team performing that communication skill. If it's, for example, a, a road working site working with high voltage lines, you take multi camera footage of that, you analyze it. And from that task analysis, you develop a reference procedure definition. And what that is, is effectively a list of all the steps, errors and critical errors associated with that particular skill. That helps you define operational, you get an operational definition of performance metrics. Then these are objective metrics. They're very specific. They detail exactly what the person needs to do. There's no ambiguity here. So for some surgical skill or for some surgical tasks, there is some variance between how surgeons would this would um, perform the surgery, but everyone who's involved in this process and on the metrics group, they must at least agree that what's designed is not wrong. So they must at least agree that this is what the reference procedure will look like. And from that metrics definition, and this is where I would come in as an instructional designer, once the metrics are defined and they're verified, they're refined and they go through a Delphi panel. At that point, let me just run back here again, we get to knowledge acquisition and knowledge acquisition is the development of an online course. As an instructional designer, it's the most objective definition of an online course I've been involved in, um, be that in University College Cork or with Flux Learning. Effectively, you have the curriculum already constructed because you have the task broken down into a series of steps, errors and critical errors. And that's what you have to teach. You have to teach your trainee what to do and what not to do. The course is based on metrics. Feedback is going to be provided for the assessment questions that are going to be provided here, and they're going to be provided using the metrics as context. Completion of the online learning is mandatory. Uh, you will not progress to in-person training for skills training on a device or on models until um, until you've completed the online component. So the completion of the online component is, is you're deemed complete with the online component when you achieve a proficiency benchmark. And how that benchmark is set is it's a mean of the experts who undertake the course before. So we present the, the course when it's constructed to um, anywhere from five to 10 experts, they undertake the course, and the mean of their scores for that course would be the pass mark effectively, or the proficiency benchmark for that course, and they typically to date have been in the 90 to 96% range. So once this trainee has completed the online component, they then move to psychomotor skill acquisition, and that's where they actually learn to perform the actual skill themselves in a lab or in a surgical setting. So this is in person training. The trainee must again demonstrate proficiency here. The trainer is there's a trainer present and the trainer has received training to provide the formative feedback that will encourage deliberate practice and help the trainee reach that benchmark. In a surgical setting, that can be with simulators, that can be with live models, it can be with uh, canine models, live pig models, and RC Academy, where I do a lot of work at the moment, they 
have made, made a, had a lot of success with a chicken model. And there's a typo, but this is not exclusively a medical or surgical procedure. It can work with ground working operate, um, operators. We've also used it for communication skills. So it's a very adaptable methodology. And again, on achievement, another typo of the proficiency benchmark, um, the trainee proceeds to supervised real world practice. This practice is also documented and feedback is provided at this stage because they have to meet a benchmark there also. And for the supervised real world application, they will send back video evidence of what they've done. So they send us back a video of a procedure or part of a procedure that they have done, and that will then be graded in accordance with the metrics. And they've been given feedback then according to the metrics. The last component, and this is a component we're still working through with Tony and uh, the RC Academy and the other institutions we work with is the mastery element. This training works on a reference skill or a reference task. So you're looking at a reference procedure, a typical case, so to speak. Wisdom and mastery comes from gaining experience and knowledge about atypical cases or events. So the mastery engine will effectively be, it could be a, effectively, it could be a curated Panopto playlist of videos, which would be narrated by the expert to undertake them, who undertook them, speaking explicitly to the metrics and how the, this case deviated from the typical case model. We're not going to require the same level of thoroughgoing assessment with the high pass mark here. This is more experiential. This is to develop wisdom rather than to get people to a proficiency benchmark in a specific task. So that is, with a whistle stop, how the the um, how the methodology is laid out. That's the various steps. Again, whistle stop of what the five stages would be. So it is now the core training methodology for RC Academy in Belgium. This is where an awful lot of robotic surgery is done. So the large robotic surgical companies, the likes of Intuitive, Medtronic, uh, Cambridge, they have robots here and they use the center for training. And increasingly, and um, they're all, well, they are all gravitating around proficiency-based progression as the methodology they want to use for this kind of training. The, the organization as well, and this is something that they're doing on a pan-European basis, they're gathering all the medical societies, they're gathering all the robotic surgical uh, companies, and they're gathering um, all of the regulatory bodies together, and they're trying to agree on a tr set of training principles going forward. So with this RC consensus group, they meet and they try to agree on the means of training going forward. So they will standardize training across Europe to this proficiency-based progression standard. And Zoom is blocking my tabs. So let me just move here for a second. So Medtronic, the with their new robot, uh, Hugo, have adopted proficiency-based progression as their, their primary means of delivering uh, training for their robot to all their new trainees. So any reference procedures, any of the basic skills that will be trained for the Hugo RAS will be done using the proficiency-based progression methodology. The rationale for them doing this is they know that with this methodology, they can achieve what is effectively a 40 to 60 percent better performance from their trainees than the traditional approach. And it's something that's even more keenly felt at the moment um, within medicine is, I suppose, medicine can't afford at the moment, particularly in these COVID times, to spare staff for training for extended periods of time. So last year we ran a study called the OSET study in Orsi. And what we did is we took four groups. Group one was given the full proficiency based progression curriculum, as I've outlined to you, granted in a whistle stop fashion here. Group two were given the curriculum, but without the online assessment or the, the performance or proficiency benchmark. Group three were given effectively standard uh, lecture content. And group four were subjected to what is called the apprenticeship model, where they were given the, a detailed list of what they needed to do and some published papers and effectively to figure it out from there. Just by putting in the proficiency benchmark, so the difference between group one and group two, um, group one completed things 17% faster. So just having a performance threshold that you have to reach before you engage in on-site training will increase performance at that on-site training. And then the difference between the group one and group four, 
Group one, and this is with mentors helping them through the process and providing that deliberate practice still. Group one achieved proficiency, so they were able to perform the task within one day in a skills lab. But the fourth group, group four, took almost three full days. That makes a major difference in terms of training time for any organization in the amount of time their, their staff member is going to be off the line or not performing their core roles. In an RC setting, there's a cost to it too. A day in RC is a thousand euros and there's accommodation and subsistence to factor into that as well. So it's a major cost saving to everybody and you end up with a better trained trainee out the other side of it. So in theory and hypothetically, everyone wins. Um, I'm conscious that time is probably against me at the <laughs> stop tour. So okay. I'm going to uh, stop there. And if anyone would like any more information on this, um, I'm, ha I'm happy to bore people into a stupor and you can reach me on LinkedIn. Thank you very much for your time, folks. Well done. And thanks for keeping to time. It's brilliant, actually. It looks fascinating. Um, do you think these principles could be applied in kind of undergraduate teaching, Patrick? I think this works particularly well for skills based work. So okay. if you have a particular skill that you want to train and you can characterize it into a set of steps, then I certainly think it can be used for undergraduate teaching from that standpoint. Um, it would need to be something that can be objectively defined, I suppose. So teaching something like critical thinking, I suppose, how do you verify or how, how do you describe the steps of a critical thinking process? How can you teach someone the objective steps of a critical thinking process? So that might be more problematic, perhaps. But we have used it f for medical, surgical, communication, both clinical and non-clinical. We've used it from all cohorts and education levels. So it's, again, the results are largely consistent. You're looking at a 40 to 60 percent performance improvement. So it's 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 a very exciting methodology to be involved with from an online learning development point of view. Excellent. And I'm sure the professional bodies would, you know, be very interested in that sort of stuff when they're work looking at curriculum as well. I'm just going to open the floor there for uh, any questions that you might have for Patrick. Patrick, is it, is it easy to, well, the figures that you show us demonstrate that it's, you know, cost benefits stuff to the to the people who are whose time you will be relieving hmm. who hopefully should see it as a benefit do, do they trust the system they the surgeons who have undertaken the training and i'm going to use the surgeons as they're i suppose our largest case group at the moment the one of them who was objectively a good surgeon beforehand what he they they trust the system because they trust the results uh, out the other side to an extent how he characterized this um this gen gentleman, uh, Ruben de Grota, he described it as it rewired his thinking about the procedure he was undertaking. And this procedure was robot-assisted radical prostatectomy. He thinks in terms of the metrics and the steps he needs to perform now. So the, the art, so to speak, is taken out of surgery. And the art arguably shouldn't necessarily have been in surgery in the first place. I don't want Van Gogh performing surgery. On me. I would like a properly trained surgeon to be performing surgery on me. And the apprentice model that existed before is flawed in that if you use an apprentice model for surgery, what happens if you assign an apprentice to a poor master? You're just perpetuating bad practice. Whereas if you have an objectively defined curriculum, you end up with a better caliber of trainee and a better surgeon out the other side. And just so, I'll sneak another question in there. To the Delphi, did you were you happy with the Delphi worked efficiently for you? The Delphi worked efficiently, and I, I admit it's not something that I'm managing myself. I, I I help with the technical components of the scoring and the voting and the documenting, but I leave the Delphi management to Professor Gallagher and other people okay. far better qualified than I. The advantage of the Delphi, I suppose, is it does occasionally it does raise elements that were absent during the proficiency based progression. But normally, when we get to Delphi stage, the metrics are very well defined. They're okay. quite there's rare fairly hugely substantive changes at that point. Great, thank you. Brilliant. That sounds great. And it does, I think, encourage a more consistent approach for of learning, you know, which is which is wonderful, you know. So that's really good. Thank you so much, Patrick.